And um, uh, so I'm going to talk about Coulomb stability of some groups. Uh, we're mostly talking about Coulomb stability. More general things about stability, and then see that some of this stuff applies to Thompson groups. But I really want to focus most on that. So we want to see that there's in some Thompson things. Conference. So the uh, general um, question of stability, from a way to say it, is are all the approximate conditions close This is the slogan of stability. Uh, and um, so if you think about like the stability is a word that comes from actor, if you hear about stability, maybe you think of stability of the EQ and stuff like that. And uh, that usually is uh, stuff of the type you take an uh, equation and you perturb the inference approximately. approximately if you take a representation, whatever consists of it, you, you perturb it a little bit, and that should be should fit whatever definition we come up uh, of a process. The question of stability is that sorry, simplification, and uh, there's a million ways to formalize this uh, in different contexts. Some people in the audience have worked on probably in different contexts. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about Coulomb stability, which is somehow the most classical uh, instance of this thing. Um, so let me uh, give you, uh, but, but, I'm, but I'm still going to give you a slightly more general. So the setup is the following. We have uh, a gamma with uh, one This is the kind of question is going to be, is gamma safe? This is the object of the scientific theorem. Um, okay, and uh, then we're talking about representations. Okay, so they should go from gamma to somewhere else. And uh, this somewhere else is a um, family of groups. And uh, in uh, this family of groups, you have to be able to talk about approximate things and about close things, right? So you need a notion of distance. So these are groups with, uh, uh, with uh, high variance. So by invariant, that means, you know, if you multiply from the left or from the right, uh, this doesn't seem present, it just, Nice notion of structure preserving distance. Um, okay, so let me just right away uh, tell you a couple examples. Uh, so, basically, what you're going to do is uh, you take the unitary group, elemental unit, because I mean, the kind of representations then that we're thinking about are. Okay, and what metric can you put on this? Well, you can endow them with a metric. This metric maybe it most typically comes from a form, and this is a, a, a I, I form. And then the way that you measure the distance is uh, you take two unitaries and then you just put the norm of their distance. And try with the unitary group. And uh, so even here, there's still some level of flexibility. And uh, there's uh, two metrics that are the most used uh, in this context. 
for the important one somehow, uh, which are well, first, uh, I don't know if, the, if I take the uh, operator norm. Right, that's uh, probably the most natural thing to take. Right, uh, and then uh, something else that behaves differently, uh, uh, Hilbert Schmidt. So this is uh, this is the, the norm that allows you to do uh, operator algebra, normalized trace. So, but you can do many more things, right? These are the only things I will mention so far, but like this is a very general set. You can take, uh, lots of people take symmetric groups with the normalized Hamming distance. Uh, I worked on uh, periodic versions of this stuff. So this is really, really uh, general. Okay, so we have now a, a group and we have a family of groups and we want to uh, understand, so what is uh, a reasonable notion of almost representation? But in this context, so this is a specific context, uh, you can measure it as follows. So you take a function with any map from gamma a group G in G. So remember that these are always always come with a um, with a distance, right? And then you can measure how far is it from being uh, an actual representation. So a representation is just a homomorphism. So I'm just gonna quantify the definition of this. So what I'm gonna look at is something called which I call the defect. Right? This is I look at the distance between phi of GH and phi of G times phi of H. So phi of gh should be equal to phi of g times phi of h if this were a homomorphism. I'm quantifying this. So what I do is I have the supremum over all gh and gamma, and then I compute this. Okay? So for me, an approximate representation is going to be something that has small Right. Okay. So that kind of formalizes the first part. And then how do you formalize the second part? Well. Well, then now I have two maps. Well, uh, how do I say that they're closed? Well, similarly, I can just measure where they're different. So I can talk about the distance by and psi. And uh, this is just going to be probably as you expect that distance by of g. So as maybe in that notation, this is. Okay, so I have a notion of uh, how good, how close is something from how, how well is the, the relation satisfied. I have a notion when two things are different, and uh, now I can uh, tell you the thing. So, gamma is stable uh, if every epsilon exists a delta such that. And if phi gamma to G uh, has small defects, let's call it beta, then there exists a homomorphism uh, with. So whenever the defect is small enough, the only thing I can do is just to take uh, the morphism and uh, so I should probably add here the probably this statement because there are other notions where you basically this is this is a very and of uh, both notions are done in a very uniform way, right? I'm computing things over the whole group at the same time. And uh, there, there are other ways to measure this. How can I suppose that that leads to? So for today, what we do is and an Ulam stability. Okay, this is just stability. Uh, uh, for me, which is 
family of with a distant family. And uh, I should say that uh, very importantly, here the delta and the epsilon are independent of epsilon. Okay, so like they in general they're independent of epsilon. Okay, if I focus on n, they're independent. So even though you're, you tend to think that, well, on u n or on, on matrix uh, high level or matrix level or four normal nodes, uh, but the equivalence dimension has families, has like infinite families that are really different. In fact, uh, you're going to see now, I'm going to tell you about a bunch of groups that are Ulam stable, but the analogous notion for the Hilbert Schmidt norm is completely different. Okay, so. There's a theorem that says that a, a finite generated the residually finite group, it can be stable in this sense with respect to the Hilbert Schmidt norm, if and only if it's virtually abelian. So like it's super, super restricted. The, in the case of the greater norm, is a much problem. We want to stress that it's not only the groups that are important for this notion, but also the norms, the way in which you measure the distances, these really matter, and they can lead to different things. Well, from now on, I'm going to focus on one of Yeah, yeah, I care about the asymptotic. So, general. So, turns out that there's there's some groups where some groups where even if you just take one, already you get inspected. Uh, I don't know of the examples where like you get inspected. Let's say that in general, so either it is really miserable or it's really a Well, so I mean, in, in this case, they do have constant there. This is that I'm and uh, one equal yeah, yeah. So that that typically, right? I mean, that works in general. There are some, uh, so the, there are some families of studying. Uh, Natural things to study uh, like the Hilbert Schmidt norm is precise. Coming distance and iteration, you, you, you can totally change the constant dimension. All right, so okay, so I give you a definition and let me directly start with the zero, uh, which is uh, uh, so maybe first I should say that. Um, uh, so if you go back to the, the paper of Feynman, we started talking about a mini background, and then there's a really nice paper of Turing uh, from the 30s, where he spoke, and then really the reason why we talk about Ulam stability is that Ulam in the 60s talked about classifying. And at the first time that we have a term like a is pretty negative. So I got done proved that there is a group. Was the first. So, actually, I've done much more. 
So there's a total notion of people call it strong Boolean stability, where instead of only looking at finite dimensional unitary representations, you look at all unitary representations. And you can say Hilbert spaces. That's a much harder to qualify. He actually proved that. Uh, but there, the story is that a lot of us, that's how we use it. Focusing on Ulam stability. This. So, so there was this theorem, and then for a long time, uh, as uh, was still, uh, there was a paper of uh, our some um, um, where they uh, no, this is the paper where the point of the So they prove two things, both of which are the first thing that they prove is that if which is a polymorphic R and gamma uh, is not. So uh, I'm not going to define this, it's not as relevant, but so a quasi-morphism is does a match from gamma to the reals that approximately satisfies the norm. Uh, if its effect is bounded, okay. Um, that's a quasi-morphism, and then there's a very trivial notion of an again, homomorphism, and then you can say. So yeah, yeah, and if you have Something that is really different, then what you can do is that you can take this one of morphism and exponentiate it. So you end up with a mapping to U1. Then, if you do some kind of rescaling, you're going to get uh, smaller and smaller defects, but still possible to take. So, quasi morphism actually produces some great numbers of stability. And uh, uh, so, for example, uh, so For example, yeah? that's an interesting. So all of these are not um, and then the other thing they prove, uh, which is uh, harder, is that SLN equals. In fact, uh, this also uh, okay, so I'm not gonna tell you about this. I'm just gonna tell you uh, keywords in the two is the uh, bounded generator. On the generation just means that uh, so an element in SLNP is a product of 100 uh, elementary generators. 100 or maybe it's more than like it's independent of the element. Um, and this is this is a, the key thing in the proof. And this is really, uh, I mean, it's not only a feature of SLNZ, but uh, it's definitely not a feature of all high rank lattices. So, uh, about uh, you might think this is all property D groups, but no, because there's property D groups that that's not the right direction. Maybe it'd be more tricky. Let's say high rank lattices, but lattices in high rank. Maybe that's a good way to generalize the result. But it turns out this is that I I have the name series I always forget. Uh, by uh, Corvaya, Rapin, Chukren, and Zanier, that uh, 
This bounded generation property is never called compact map. Uh, high rank for compact map. If you want to go for look for a generalization, then uh, this book does not work. No way to adapt. But uh, it's uh, this is kind of a rigidity property, and for lattice in one point. I always spoke of a fine dichotomy of Antoine, it's not rigid and it's very natural to wonder are high rank lattices. It turns out that they are. Uh, so, um, here we have. So they show that most are non-fringe. And this most now really means more. And there's a there's kind of a technical condition the thing and uh I don't know if, like, if the rank is at least four or something, you can complex structure you can do with an or non Archimedean field you can. Do. So like, they, it, they, there's some technicalities that you need for like lattice in the three R you can do it. But uh, I mean, morally, morally you should think, okay, there's now proof that high rank lattice. Have time until half past, right? So uh, this is this custom rules uh, method of coping. But most the, the most important thing there is three new conceptions that allows you to glance at these four groups and then uh, hopefully eventually solve. No, no, most is very inclusive. Really like there's a there's a crucial thing. So, so so what is going on here is there's a there's a there's okay. and then there's a long list of most examples you might care about is they have a long list again most happy and okay so. Uh, so this is now the part where I need to be. Um, so here's the idea. So now the point that so um, the one of stability came so now it's in a state. If I can rephrase the epsilon that came in. Uh, sequence gamma is such that the effect of this high end and there exists uh, so the when <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a phi end. Yeah, it's the same idea. I mean, it doesn't need to have it. This can be a, you, you can find it. But they need to say, yeah, no, they need to. Yeah, yeah, it's the same, yeah. Sorry, I was coming. Um, then there exists a sequence of dimorphisms. Uh, time kind of this counterexample, then you can have to be able to correct. And the uh, fact uh, 
this is uh, technical, but, uh, but you can also do it with algorithms. Uh, Omega is um, This is relevant for the part, but you can also do it. Not okay, so now this this thing is nice because now I can package everything together in one home. What I can do is I can gamma, boom, I can package all this together in a side, goes to the ultra part. Which I can do because it's a textbook. What is in relation? And uh, so what is uh, what is this? Well, this is simply a uh, uh, no direct product. Right? The definition of this is just the quotient of the direct product where I identify two sequences that you know asymptotically are the one and over two. Carefully about really the metric. And uh, what is stability? Well, stability is precisely so I want to be able to have a homomorphism here. What is a homomorphism? That's very important. Uh, so I have a homomorphism of the coordinates. And what does it mean that this lives? Well, it means that when I pass again to the uh, ultra product, so then So, upshot is stability is uh, so this works well for the notion of point points. Yeah, uh, right? Where you in the text you're really measuring them point wise. Once that you take two things like G and H, then the homomorphism relation is asymptotically satisfied for this. And uh, but then maybe the speed which this goes to is different. Right? There's this point right now. Yeah. But there, uh, really, this uh, ultra product. Uh, so, what's the nice thing about the uh, fitting uh, problem is that you have tools. Which uh, the kind of main tool to solve the problem is second tool. You can have a, uh, uh, you can have a lifting problem with a meet with a median kernel. Uh, second group homology takes care. So there is a second homology class that punishes it when I lift. This has very no right? So the kernel here is plastic, right? But there is something. And, and this is really a miracle. Uh, but the, what, what you can do is that you can calculate the version. So instead of taking the ultra product, take ultra product, so the, the, the product of the UN, and instead of modding up things that go to zero, you mod, uh, you go, go to zero from the limit, you mod up things that go to zero at a given speed. That no n is some speed that goes to zero. Other things that go around the speed. And here you can push things that go faster. This is again the UN, but now you want a small O. So now you have another um, other lifting problem. This is it. And now if you have if your homomorphism, your approximate homomorphism goes to zero at this speed, then you can go here. And you ask another story, can I improve this? You can believe me that if you can always improve this, at the limit, then you're safe. If you have a limit argument. Okay, and the miracle is that the kernel of this, not only is it a billion, it has a structure of an axis. And depending on uh, what norm you use, you can even have the structure of a hill boost. Okay, so th this is a complete miracle. And the reason, the reason why it works is because the norm 
of the commutator if uh, a an and the by x and the n to the and the commutator uh, goes like x and so things become a big in the order. Okay, and so this basically tells you that spectral cohomology vanishes certain class of this gives you point by point. So does it work for Coulomb stability, right? So now, now, we, now we're back to our thing of Coulomb stability. Now there is an added struct, which is that now you want, you don't want just a formal, you want something that is unique. So now you can capture it. And uh, so it turns out that from the cohomological point of view, having this be uniform is the same as having the four cycles in the cohomology class be bounded. Okay. And uh, when you hear something like this, I'm sure you might get excited because there's a there's a theory called bounded cohomology, which is developed. There's just okay, maybe point by stability or cohomology management. Bounded cohomology that would be very cool. And lots of bounded uh, and uh, it turns out that this is not the case. And the problem is completely different from it. So if while bounded for cycles, can I ensure that uh, these uh, uh, are uniform? Okay, solving then this limiting problem in bounded cohomology is does not guarantee that the limit is uniform. A very annoying thing to have. But uh, uh, yeah, the limit of if it works, maybe it's cool for this. But like kind of formally, it doesn't work. I'm not sure this works. So what do you do? Do you give up? Well, they did not give up. They introduced a new cohomology. Yeah. I, I did not define it, but uh, that is like you should you should think this, and you should think that the momentum is just like pairwise uh, to h. You want this to go to this, then you want the distance to go to zero. Point this point and this. Point. Okay, so the, the real theorem there helps that so a combination of two things. The first thing is that uh, there exists a uh, homology theory. But that uh, H H not the discord asymptotic, but an asymptotic homology vanishing with respect to a, a certain class of perturbations. Talk about the second one the uh, asymptotic from then gamma is gonna be and the second thing so I and uh, so I told you that this is the first attempt to do this kind of thing with bounded uh, um, homology, and then it doesn't work, and you need to. I, I think of it as a a version where like all of these false homologies go to it's a more complicated version of bounded cohomology, and in fact, have uh, for every bounded cohomology vanishing result is a second set. We know now there is an analogous result for the cohomology. So uh, for yellow groups, comes them to bounded cohomology. I'm not specifying the coefficient. Uh, well, and then uh, they could uh, 
Thank you. 